Um, yeah, this study kind of went in a way a little different than I had originally been planning it, but um, I wanted to, to talk a little bit. We've talked uh, about the change in, in marriage, uh, the change in social attitudes about marriage, uh, the biblical model of marriage. Uh, we're, we're kind of left then with the last question of how the church is going to respond to all this, because there's no changing it. Society is going to do what society is going to do, and so are the courts. Uh, they're going to continue to try and legislate morality and force Christians to be like the world. So really, we have to know how to deal with it. Um, and I think part of knowing how to deal with it is also having an answer for, the, for a lot of the rhetoric that's swirling around these days. Uh, you know, it's not just enough, if we're going to bear witness of this in the world, it's not just enough to be able to tell people, well, the Bible says so, and that's the end of it. Um, because the world is convinced that its reasons are rational and reasonable uh, and, and airtight, in fact. And I think as Christians, it's helpful as we respond to this whole mess to know that there actually is a way to deal with this and talk to a secular world uh, at a level they're not going to immediately reject. So at any rate, uh, to begin with, something that, that one is hearing more and more of these days, and it's a different take on the same idea, the idea of love is love. Love is love. Homosexual love is the same as heterosexual love is the same as whatever other kind of love you want to call. But love is love. Uh, I had um, some a lesbian young woman once say to me, well, sex is sex, same thing. doesn't matter who it's with or what it's with. It's all the same things. So, in fact, I think Miley Cyrus just this week made that statement as she uh, revealed the fact that she is a lesbian and uh, heaven knows what else. I think, what did you tell me her statement was? That as long as it's legal, she will love whatever and whoever she wants. So, yeah, that's our culture. Love is love. How do you respond to that? Uh, two ways come to mind. Uh, in 1 John, if you want to look there. 1 John 4, to start with. Uh, should, we, should we let that statement just go when we hear it? And we will hear it. Is love love? And the answer is, is no. Love is not love. Not all love is the same. And as Christians, we are given a unique kind of love that is unlike anything else in all creation. A love that's not an emotion and not a feeling, but a love that is in fact based on an historical sacrifice, uh, a self-emptying, giving kind of love that changed us. So 1 John 4, 10 and 11 in this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. Uh, love is love is a human idea, humanistic. Uh, it, it takes no consideration of the love of God. We are joined to a form of love beyond the humanistic. Uh, in fact... Uh, I'm, I think I make this point later, but I'll make it here. In a way, uh, the, words, the words hetero and homo are Greek in origin. Het heteros in Greek literally means other, different. Homo in Greek, or homos, means same as or like. So heterosexual a sexuality, sexual activity with those who are other or different than yourselves. Uh, in a way, when we talk about the love of God, we are talking about something that is hetero in nature. That is, it is a love for that which is wholly other and different. God cannot love that which is the same as himself, because there is nothing the same as God. When God gives his love to humanity, he is loving that which is wholly other and different. So all of God's love for humanity is hetero in nature, and not heterosexual, just hetero. It's different. 
When God created man and woman, he instilled within them that hetero kind of love, the love for one another, even though you're radically different and other. It's not the love for that which is same as. It's a love for that which is different than. So as Christians, we are taken up into the love of God that loved that which was different to such an extent that, it totally, that he totally emptied himself and sacrificed himself so that we might be more than we otherwise would be. So love is not love. Uh, there is, in fact, different forms of love, higher forms of love. There's divine love and there's human love. Saving love and damning love. 2 John 1 6. I guess there is only one chapter there in 2 John. Now, something else that when we're talking about a love joined to the divine or joined to God, now here it says, This is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you should walk in it. To love God, or to be one with the love of God, is in fact to follow God's word and obey him. A kid who constantly disobeys his parents doesn't love them, even if he tells them, I love you. Love and obedience go together. So love is love. No, it isn't. Uh, any love that stands opposite God's word and chooses to be disobedient is not love. Any comments there? The other one, then, uh, the other bit of rhetoric that really sways a lot of people, sad to say, is the rhetoric of born that way. Uh, under current logic, if one is born with a certain propensity that is toward hetero or homosexuality, then one can claim his or her desires are immutable. Um, born that way. I had, unfortunately, a, a debate with a member, and, or a member, someone who used to be a member who's not a member anymore, about this very thing, that they could not, could not bring themselves to leave the idea that you're born that way. They can't help it. They're born that way, so who are we to judge? It sounds reasonable, even sounds Christian in a way, who are we to judge? But, and I asked, where's the evidence you're born that way? Show me something. Show me a study. Oh, there's all kinds of studies. Show me one. I'm not asking for all kinds of them. One study that gives verifiable proof that this is something rooted in your biology, that you're born that way and you can't help it. There is no study. There is no scientific evidence for this at all. Even though, uh, in the course of this debate, uh, I find out that this person's daughter, who came to her defense, um, heard at Iowa State in some sociology class, I think, that, uh, that you are in fact born that way, that it is physiological, that it's within, it happens in the womb in the process of development with a hormonal or chromosomal uh, difference at that point of development. And that's what makes a person homosexual. So you, they, they are born that way. That's what's being taught at the university. And it's flat out dead scientifically wrong. There's no evidence of that. None. But they're teaching it. So you, you have kids who don't know any better listening to PhDs in science telling them something that is patently false scientifically. And they believe it. And then somebody standing on the outside saying, no, it's, they're not telling you the truth. Who are they going to believe? So at any rate, uh, in this marriage debate, the same-sex marriage debate, I think it's helpful for us as Christians to have an answer to this because we are going to hear it again and again and again. You're born that way. Uh, the Supreme Court, in fact, of Iowa, when they issued their ruling on same-sex marriage, this became a major point of their ruling. Here's a quote from their ruling. A human trait that defines a group is immutable when that trait exists solely by accident of birth, and they cite the case studies, or when a person with the trait has no ability to change it. All right, so immutability is something you are born with 
that you cannot change or something that just simply happens to you, you cannot change. So for example, uh, your race is immutable. You're born into it. Or a disability, in a way, can be immutable. Either from birth or, you know, if you lose your, your arm or leg in combat or something like that, you can't change that. It's now an immutable trait. And if something is immutable, then it's covered under, under law. It's protected by law. Our country defends people that can't help their circumstances. We have American Civil, Civil Americans with Disabilities Act to help with disability people and all kinds of um, discrimination laws to help those of, of various race. So, okay, so that's, that's the historic definition of immutability. You can't change it, and it, is, and it is something that's happened by birth. Next paragraph. Accordingly, because sexual orientation is central to a person's identity, and may be altered, if at all, only at the expense of significant damage to the individual's sense of self. Classifications based on sexual orientation are no less entitled to consideration as a suspect or quasi-suspect class than any other group that has been deemed to exhibit immutable characteristics. Sexual orientation is immutable. Even though we have defined immutability as something identifiable in birth or you know, by accident or whatever after. Now we're redefining the word immutable to include anything central to a person's identity that may be altered only at the expense of a significant damage to a person's individual sense of self. What in the heck does that even mean? How do you damage a person's individual sense of self? What, what, is it, what does that mean? This woman who had pretended to be black, she said that her uh, inside told her she was black. Absolutely. She was more black than white. Yes. Even though by birth she was white. Absolutely right. So under, under the Iowa Supreme Court's ruling, she should be allowed to identify her as she wants legally. She should be protected by law because to change her identity is to damage her sense of self. She kept saying her sense of self. That yeah. That was her big word in this bit that I heard. But that's actually legal language protected by law. That's why she's using it. Because as soon as you say, this is essential to my sense of self, you are protected by law. You can measure scientifically, you can, you can objectively verify an issue like race, or an issue like gender, uh, or a disability. The, the old school definition of immutability is verifiable. The new definition of immutability is not. There's no test to determine what a person's inner sense of self really is. It's totally undefinable, but it's also now totally protected by law. So again, if this is the definition of immutability, think of the Pandora's box that this opens up. A person can say anything is essential to their sense of self. Where's the line? Polygamy now. Nothing, there's nothing in the way of this. A person can easily say, well, my sense of self demands polygamy. And the government is going to have to say, okay, because they've already redefined polygamy to include anything that damages your sense of self. Uh, and it is, it's undefinable. What does it mean? What is a sense of self? Totally undefinable. How often does it change? Yeah. Maybe she gets tired of being black, maybe she'll be Chinese in a couple of weeks. Well, sure, and then that would be valid. Um, yeah, even, you know, this can be used as a defense, and, <clears throat> and uh, the, the homosexual community denies this. This could be used as a defense for bestiality, for that matter. Uh, there's been a couple of things recently in the news 
uh, about uh, uh, people caught with dogs, young, young girls caught with dogs who feel totally justified in this, uh, doing things with animals. Um, oh, why shouldn't they? The world is telling them that if that's essential to their sense of self, it's immutable, they can't help it, so who's to judge them? Now, this is, this is where we are with this kind of argument. So when you hear born that way, understand that this is, th this is essential language to hide under legal protections, because that means it's immutable, that means it can't be helped, that means it's the same as race or anything else. And that racial card does get used in this debate. Uh, I've had it several times thrown at me, uh, the fact that uh, this is to deny homosexuality or deny same-sex marriage is akin to um, segregation and racial discrimination. And, you know, at first that left me utterly dumbfounded. How in the world can you connect those two things? But this is how, because it's seen as immutable. So... A question we've already answered, where's the line between what behaviors and traits are legally protected and what are not? There isn't a line. That's the problem. What other sexual behaviors could the immutability argument be used with? You know, why not marrying cousins if that's essential to your sense of self? Uh, all, the, all the laws that are in place now, as far as what's acceptable or not sexually, are off the table. Anything goes. Um, How does the law even get written? It's just the way that Absolutely. Yeah, this is why the Supreme Court justices, all of them in Iowa, should have been fired on the spot and replaced. I'm glad we got rid of three of them. We should have gotten rid of the rest of them. Because it's, it is. It's an utter logical impossibility. You define it correctly in the first paragraph and totally rewrite it in the second paragraph. That's absolutely right. I mean, it makes Tarzan a jungle animal. <laughs> yeah. I mean, just because I was raised by them. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. It does. It's, um, it, it leaves utter chaos as the rule of law. So, going on, being born that way is, an essential, is essential in establishing immutability and therefore guaranteeing legal protection and social acceptance. What follows are the most popular studies cited for proof of being born into homosexuality. And again, I didn't really intend to go this direction with this study today, but in, in answering how is the church going to respond to all this, I think we do need to know there is a response uh, even at a secular level, even a, 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 a scientific, if you will, although it's, sociology is always soft science, uh, a scientific level to deal with this. We are not outgunned as Christians scientifically. Simon LeVay in the study of the human brain. 1991, Simon LeVay conducted research on the brain looking for possible biological causes for homosexuality. By the way, Simon LeVay was himself homosexual, and he went into the study looking to find a, a, a cause for homosexuality. Now, if any of you even took high school science, you would know that that is already a violation of scientific principle. You don't go into a study looking to find an answer. You're supposed to go into a study with an open mind. He went into this purposely trying to find something to verify his own, his own bias. So automatically, that ruins the study, but without going there. He studied a portion of the brain called INAH, uh, inter, oh boy, I better let a medical person pronounce that, interstitial nuclei of the uh, anterior hypothalamus. Uh, there are actually four of these structures grouped together in the brain. Levain's study included a total of 41 cadavers, 35 males, 6 females. He attempted to identify which males were homosexual, which he counted 19 of them, and which were heterosexual, 16. All those identified as homosexual died of complications related to AIDS, uh, as had 6 of the men identified as heterosexual, presumably having contracted it from using dirty needles. The sexual orientation of the subject was presumed. Their actual sexual history was not available. All right, so what do you see as a methodological problem here? 
He doesn't know what the orientation of these people are. He's assuming they're homosexual because they died of AIDS. That's a pretty big assumption. Most of, the, most of the people dying in Africa of AIDS, and there's a lot of them right now, are not homosexual. Uh, secondly, his group that he's studying, remember, he's, he's, he's looking for a physiological cause of homosexuality. His group is identified as having a disease. <laughs> these, these are not people with healthy brains. They, they have a disease. So again, the, the way that destroys the scientific method and his, and his basis for a, 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 a test group, a, a control group. He doesn't have a control group. His control group is assumed, he doesn't know their orientation, and they're diseased. So this is, the whole study is already questionable. Uh, LaVey measured the volumes of the various INAH regions and recorded that the INAH3 region was larger in heterosexual males than both heterosexual women and homosexual men. LaVey's own interpretation of his research as follows. So, okay, there's four of these little regions in the hypothalamus. One of them shows a difference in his study between homosexual and heterosexual men, particularly. Um, actually, later studies will confirm this, so, but, but we'll get to that. It's important to stress what I didn't find. This is LaVey's own words. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. I didn't show that gay men are born that way, the most common mistake people make in interpreting my work, nor did I locate a gay center in the brain. All he showed is this region of the brain is different between heterosexual men and homosexual men. He did show that. Consequence study, verification which is essential to the scientific method. William Bine, published 2001, advanced LaVey's findings by noting that the volume difference between men and women in INAH3 was due to a difference in the number of neurons, not in their size or density. So, okay, the fact that men have, more, have, a, have a larger region of this brain than women, the reason for that difference is physiological uh, from birth that men have more neurons in that region than women do. So that's, again, scientifically verifiable. That's what he says. Uh, Bain also noted a smaller INAH3 in homosexual males than heterosexual males. So he found the same thing LaVey found. This was determined not to be the result of fewer neurons as in the difference between men and women, but a difference in neuron density. The neurons in homosexual men were packed more tightly together. Bein stated, if validation by independent replication, uh, if validated by independent replication, the present findings could reflect a reduction of neurophil within INAH3 in the homosexual group. Neurophils, basically the stuff between the neuron cells in which the cells are embedded. So it's a network of various nerve fibers and synapses. The male homosexual subject studied exhibited less neurophil than heterosexual males. There is a physiological difference, but what does that mean? Here's his take on it. Studies by uh, Bide and Beattie, 1984, and Turner and Greenbaum, 85, show that postnatal experience in animals has been shown to affect neurophil in certain regions of the brain. In other words, behavior and life experience affects neurophil. Instead of the smaller INH3 in homosexual men being a cause of homosexuality, Bein seems to favor the smaller uh, INAH3 being a result of behavior and experience. And he, his quote, in humans, the major expansion of the brain occurs postnatally while the individual is in constant interaction with the environment. And it's verified by another study. Uh, instead of the structure of the brain influencing behavior, behavior can actually influence the structure of the brain. Just because there may be a difference, again, 
does not necessarily dictate the cause of that difference. And it has been proven that the structure of the brain, the density of, of the neurons, how they're packed, is affected by behavior. It may actually be a, a kind of a scientific verification of what Scripture told us all along with someone being confirmed in their sin. Uh, someone's heart being hardened. The brain can actually be changed because of behavior. So it is not a matter of born that way. It's a matter of you become dependent based on your ongoing behavior of a certain, of a certain continued behavior. Uh, yeah, we're not going to have time to go through all of it. But there will be a, a, another study, worth reading if you want to take the time and read it on your own, that we'll cite later. Um, where it is believed by most, I shouldn't say most, it's believed by a lot of sociologists, that sexual identity is formed by age three. That, that the, the, the structures of the brain and all of that... Um, are largely in place by age three. And that gender identity and sexual identity is often formed more by, by parenting than anything. Actually, this, the twin study is worth looking at because it does come out in that. And, and in ways, parents may not, may not be trying to do this. So the next one, Bailey Pillar study of twins. Uh, their study claimed a ratio of 52%, 29 out of 56, were identical twins. No, we're talking identical twins, not, not just twins. Identical twins, so they're both of the same genes. Their genetic makeup between the identical twins should be identical. Identical twins were both homosexual, 52%. By comparison, they claimed only 22% of non-identical twins were shared homosexual orientation and a ratio of 11% where adoptive brothers were both homosexual. The much greater ratio of homosexuality among identical twins demonstrated, they claimed, evidence of a genetic source for determining sexual orientation. They're certainly not the only researchers that came to this conclusion. In 2000, uh, Kendler, Thornton, Gilman, and Kessler published a study in the American Journal of Psychiatry where they claimed to find a rate of 31.6% among monozygotic twins, that's identical twins, where both were non-heterosexual. Now, if they're genetically identical, and if homosexuality is genetically caused, then it should be 100%. So 31% actually disproves their theory, even 52% even disproves their theory. But nonetheless, uh, if what they say is right, that's a pretty high ratio. Uh, going on, though, sexual orientation in a U.S. national sample of twins and non-twin sibling pairs, American Journal of Psychiatry, uh, 2000. Out of 324 monozygotic twin study, Kendler found 19 pairs where one claimed to be non-heterosexual. And of those, only six were found where both twins were heterosexual. So again, his study says 31% of twins where one is homosexual, they'll both be homosexual. Sounds like a large number. When you look at the whole statistic, though, it changes. 31.6% uh, sounds impressive until one considers it involves only six pairs of twins out of a sample base of 324 pairs. Six pairs represents 1.8% of the total sample, which is very similar to the overall rate of homosexuality in the general population. It's, it's thought, and, I, and after I, you asked me this the other day, Arvine, and I said wrong, I looked it up afterwards. The actual, uh, the actual rate of homosexuality among the general population is thought to be in the area of 1.6%. Uh, there was a, a study, a Kinsey study, that claimed 10% of the population is homosexual. It turns out that's an utter fabrication. More realistic, less than 2%. Like 1.6%. So actually, all their, all their study of twins found was a ratio the same as the general population. In 2002, a study published in the American Journal of Sociology reviewed the results of these earlier studies and came to a radically different conclusion. 
The study by Bierman and Bruckner entitled Opposite Sex Twins and Adolescent Same-Sex Attraction used a much larger sampling of twins and took notice of the methodological weaknesses in previous studies. For instance, in the previous studies, both twins were not always interviewed to determine sexual preference. Okay? They claimed that identical twins you know, they had this uh, ratio of shared homosexuality. Turns out they didn't actually interview both twins. They would interview one and say, by the way, what's your brother? And leave it up to the one to tell what the other one was. Uh, so that's a problem. Uh, often one twin spoke for the other and made assumptions on the other's sexuality. Bierman and Bruckner noted that non-heterosexual persons are more likely than others to misidentify their heterosexual siblings as homosexual. There's actually a study to that effect. Again, provable. This applies in the same even for twins. They cite a study by Kirk, Bailey, and Martin, 1999, that gives clinical evidence for this claim. They noted a procedural weakness in previous twin studies that supported genetic causes for homosexuals, uh, homosexuality. The twins used in those studies were volunteers. Yet other studies prove that those who volunteer for studies on sexuality tend to be more educated and possess more liberal attitudes than those who do not volunteer. I mean, seriously, you, you, you go up to some conservative farmer and say, hey, would you do a study on sexuality? You know, I would be willing to bet most of you guys would say, ew, you know, no. Well, but, but if you're talking to someone who's got a liberal agenda, would you do a study on sexuality? Well, sure I would, because that's the liberal agenda. So naturally, you're going to get more volunteers that are liberal-minded than conservative-minded, because conservative people, it grosses them out. So already, the sample base is tainted. The Bierman Bruckner study, in contrast, was based on national longitudinal studies uh, of adolescent health, which involved children from across the country, 7th to 12th grades. It was not based on a small group of tin, the twins volunteering for a study on sexuality. And another thing, where do you think they got those volunteers in this study? Advertising in homosexual magazines. Seriously. So their sample base is coming from a homosexual crowd committed to homosexuality. Because you have to be pretty committed to subscribe to a homosexual magazine. You have to not care what anybody else thinks, because the postman is going to see that coming into your, into your mailbox. Uh, everything about the sampling that they chose for their studies was wrong. Methodologically biased. This other study, then, removes the methodological bias by sampling uh, a national study, not asking for volunteers, just going to high schools, and actually questioning both twins instead of just one. So what did the new study come up with? Where Bailey and Pillar claimed a 52% rate uh, and Kendler 31.6% of shared homosexuality between male identical twins, and where one of the two identified as homosexual, Bierman and Bruckner found a 7.7% rate of concordance that is both sharing the same sexual preference among males, and a 5.3% rate among females. Their findings radically contradict Bailey and Pillard and strongly speak against a genetic source for homosexual preference. The reason offered by Bierman and Bruckner for the large discrepancy from previous studies was error in the sample base of previous studies. Instead of random sampling, Bailey and Pillard recruited volunteers in gay publications. And instead of direct questioning about sexual preference, there was acceptance of second-hand judgment of twins about their co-twin. So the, the new study totally debunks the idea of genetic causes for homosexuality. Because the, the identical twins do not have identical sexual preferences. The one remarkable find in the Bierman and Bruckner study was that same-sex attraction, not same-sex behavior, mind you, rates are much higher among males in opposite gender twins than among their female counterparts or among any other sibling group. Where an older brother is present in the family, same-sex attraction among male opposite gender twins falls to 8.8%. 
It begs the question why same-sex attraction should be so high among male opposite gender twins and why rates change so not noticeably when an older male sibling is present. The explanation points to parental social influences in determining sexual preference. Parents with an older male child have well-established gender expectations. The toys, clothing, room ornamentation are male-oriented. The older brother will himself encourage male-oriented play with his younger brother. So the gender expectations of the younger twin's immediate social context direct him towards a clear male self-identification. This is why I said the parents may not even understand or, or, or know how they're influencing a kid's sexual identification. Uh, opposite gender twin, so a, a male and a female identical twin, the odds of that male coming out homosexual are almost double uh, the same set of twins with an older brother. Why? Why do you think? Why with opposite gender identical twins would there be a higher chance for the male developing homosexual tendencies? Especially if it's a first kid. And that's that's another thing the study points out. Because if it's a first kid, when they're babies, you probably dress them in the same clothes. I mean, you don't, you don't necessarily differentiate male and female when they're that big. This, sexual identity is a weird thing. I've, I've come to find this out in studying it. It's not necessarily, your, your, your orientation, and I, I don't even like that term, but I'll use it. Your orientation is a soft choice. It's not a hard choice, always. Sometimes it is. Some people choose flat out to be homosexual. But there, there are those who don't ever remember having chosen it. But that doesn't mean that they were born that way. There are social influences like this that can lead a person to that point unknowingly. Uh, I mentioned before, I talked to a pastor friend of mine who was raped as a child by a neighborhood boy, seven years old. And from that point on, uh, could never develop another relationship with a male. Was ever, never trusting of males. And he's been same-sex attracted for as long as he can remember. He's living a celibate life. He knows it's sinful. He doesn't want it. He, he repents of it constantly, but it's there. Largely because of this horrible thing that happened in his life that totally messed up his, his identity, his sexual identity. So it can be negatively affected through trauma. It can also be confused even if you have two opposite gender kids you're raising them both essentially swapping things back and forth between them when they're little. The toys you get, you don't necessarily buy trucks for the boys and Barbies for the girls. They're playing together all the time, so they're playing with each other's stuff. Um, for some reason, and again, this, this isn't identified, but for some reason, males are much more prone to influence when it comes to their identity than girls are. Tom boys don't necessarily grow up to be lesbians. In fact, the, the rates, other studies I've read say the rate of Tom boys that grow up to become lesbian is, is non-existent over the general population. So girls who act like boys aren't necessarily more prone to lesbianism. But boys that act like girls are. So there's, there's something in the influence of the male as he grows that is much more susceptible to, to social pressures than females. And don't know exactly what that is. But it's enough to affect a, a study like this that they note it's, it's, a, it's, it's done something. I mean, it's, it's noticeable, it's verifiable. Gender expectations, even in, in development from baby to three years old, are huge in establishing how a child is going to form. 
So to answer, again, as the church has to address this when it comes from the world, the claim of immutability are born that way. My reason for bringing any of this up is that as Christians, we don't just have to point at the Bible and say, the Bible says it's wrong, therefore it's wrong. We can do that if we want, but it's not going to convince anybody who doesn't believe in the Bible. But there, there, there is a way that we can carry on a conversation with a secular audience. There is verifiable scientific sociological studies out there that show us how sexual identity can develop. And it is not a matter of being born that way. There has never been a single study conducted that has been able to prove that there is a root biological or physiological cause for homosexuality. And even if there is someday a study, and there won't be because it's sociological, not physiological, but even supposing a study does show that there is some sort of root physiological thing you're born with that makes you more susceptible to a homosexual mindset, even that doesn't prove anything. Because in order for a, a physiological propensity to express itself, there has to be a willingness in the person to allow it to express itself. Take, for instance, um, again, and I haven't verified this, so it, it may or may not be right, but I've been, I've been told that within American Indians, there is a, a physiological weakness towards alcohol that leads, that leads some to become alcoholic. May or may not be true, I don't know. But if it is, a person doesn't become alcoholic just because there's something in your genes that make you susceptible to it. You have to willingly drink. And you have to express that weakness and give yourself over to that weakness. So even if it were true that there's a biological root to it, which it is not true, a person still has to ultimately will to give yourself over to that. It doesn't force you to become that. So we have plenty of ground to stand on as Christians and argue this on a secular level. We're almost out of time. Does anybody have any thoughts or questions about any of it? Not, no, not, not that I know of in Christian homes. And that would be difficult to measure statistically anyway, because lots of people who say they're Christian aren't. Um, uh, no, there are... Yeah, you know, as another example, though, of how statistics can be manipulated, a, a lot of the studies that are used in court are based on comparisons between um, homosexual families and broken heterosexual families. Now, the claim is put out there that homosexuals can raise children just effectively as heterosexuals, and they quote all kinds of statistics showing the same outcome for kids. As it turns out, the vast majority of these studies are quoting a comparison group in heterosexuals of single moms raising kids, not intact biological families. And single moms, statistically, have a harder time raising kids. The kids are prone to have more sociological, psychological issues growing up. So that comparison group between single moms and, and homosexual couples is similar. But it's not similar when you look at intact mom and dad families. So you've got to be very careful. I never want to get us into an argument, a sociological argument. I'm just saying by this that we are not outgunned when it comes to the studies that are out there as Christians. It's not us versus science. I'm sure you've heard the argument that I was born that way, and God did not create sin. So, yeah. you know, they justify it by saying, well, I was born that way, so it's not a sin because right. God doesn't create sin. Exactly. That, it, it's immutable, can't help it, therefore God, God made me that way, I just have to embrace it. Yeah, yeah, it is. So we, we can't let them get away with the born that way argument because it becomes a justification. And there's plenty of evidence out there to show you're not born that way. There's not, again, 
ask for a study. If somebody says it's been proven, ask for the specifics. Show me the study. Tell me who did it, where they did it, where are the results, I want to look at it. Ask for it. Because it always silences the other side when I ask for it, and I always ask for it when they say that. Show me the study. Just cite it, and I'll look it up myself. Who did this? Who studied it, and what were they studying? There is no study. It does not exist. Even though profs at, at the university continue to tell kids that it does exist. It doesn't. All right, let's close with prayer. Gracious Father, in this confusing world, we pray for wisdom and understanding as we try and help others see your grace and the purity of life that you have given us in Christ. Use us in this world to proclaim you to those who do not know you, that others might be drawn into your love and brought into eternal life. For Jesus' sake, amen.